Happy Easter, Parks family. We are celebrating today the greatest reality in the planet, that our Savior, Jesus Christ, rose from the dead. We're celebrating with brothers and sisters across the world that fact. But we acknowledge that across the world also, this is probably one of the strangest Easter Sundays ever. I mean, in in my life, I've never not been in church with my brothers and sisters in Christ on Easter Sunday. I mean, for us, even as the Parks Church, we've spent the last 10 years together on Good Friday, on Saturday, right? At at the massive Easter egg hunts where we're trying to corral a thousand kids as they go after plastic eggs and stale candy, right? A day where we all get our first sunburn of the year and we're able to show it off together on Easter Sunday. This is a strange day for sure, but we're not going to let it stop us from rejoicing in the resurrection of our Savior. And so we wanted to do something uh, that, that we have a term around here called force fellowship. Uh, we thought Easter Sunday would be a great opportunity for us to practice a little bit of force fellowship. If you don't know what force fellowship is, it's our time after announcements that for the introverts, you just simply spin or turn and try not to talk to anyone. For the extroverts, you shine and you get out and you greet people. Well, we're not able to do that now, but we wanted to still send the same greeting, especially here on Easter. So we're going to practice a little forced fellowship with our cell phones. So here, here's what I want you to do. We're going to put uh, one minute on the clock and, and Zach's going to give us s- some music to text to here in just a bit. And we're going to text three people. You're going to text three people. Listen, this is cheesy, I know, but we want to we wanna spread the love here, okay? We want to text three people. Christ is risen. All right, so I'm going to do it. Zach's going to put on some music. We're going to spend a minute here. Do it. Don't watch me. Just do it. Text three people. Christ is risen. All right, here, here we go. All right, texting. And for you teenagers, I know a minute's time is a little bit too long, so text 300 people in a minute if you can. Text. Keep texting. And don't be offended if you don't get a text back, all right? If you do get a text, it's Easter. Remember, you know what to respond. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. That's the response. All right. Should be finishing up. Finish up. All right. Now, here's what I want you to do. Put your phones away something that probably is so hard to do, especially in this quarantine because we've been uniquely tethered to them. Our focus right now is to focus on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Like I've said a hundred times, this is a weird Easter. This is a strange, unique moment in the history of the world. But listen to me, whether we're quarantined, whether we're scattered or we're gathered, that does not change the fact and the reality that Jesus Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. And so as the scattered church on this Easter Sunday, may we lift our voices, maybe even more loudly than we ever have before to celebrate that our King, King Jesus, is not a king who is dead and buried, but he is a king who rose from the dead and stands in eternity on his throne forever. Let's sing together this Easter Sunday. When I searched the world But it couldn't feel me Man's empty praise Treasures that fade Are never enough You came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing. Oh, there's nothing.
Father, there is nothing and no one better than you. You truly are the one who turns our mourning to dancing. You exchange beauty um, for our ashes. You take shame and exchange it for glory. And Lord, you are truly the only one who can. And so I pray in these moments moving forward this Easter Sunday that you might capture our hearts again with the reality of the resurrection of your son, Jesus. Maybe someone watching, you would capture their heart for the first time. Lord, we know that you can and you do. All of this is for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Um, I don't know if anyone else has experienced this, but uh, during this quarantine state, uh, I found just my emotions are all over the map. I have all of these emotional swings. And and, and one of the the swings I don't mind sharing uh, with all of you uh, while this is being recorded is I, I found myself painting in our our bathroom, uh, like many of us doing home projects right now, painting in our bathroom. And my son, Mac, who's four, came in and asked, hey, hey, can I help you paint, dad? And I'm like, sure, buddy, come on, help help me, help me paint. And so he and I, we're we're the only two, we're in in our bathroom painting and and we got some music playing while we're painting. And and, and listen, I'm I'm not a crier. I know this shirt would would allude to to otherwise, but but I'm not a crier. And uh, I was there painting with my son and some song came on and I, my eyes just begin to like well up with, with tears as I look at my son painting and I'm like, what, what, what is happening? And so I'm painting and I'm like trying to, you know, and, and, and then Tessa walks into our, our, our bathroom and she looks at me and she's like, are you, are you crying? Which then alerts our four-year-old son to look at dad and say, what, 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 what's, what's, what's going on, dad? Why, why, why are you crying? And I'm like, hey, check, it's, it's, it's the fumes. And so I'm like, I'm like wiping, trying to compose myself. And, and, uh, and, and I did, and I, I finished the, the project. Um, but if, if you can resonate with that and stop pointing around the room about emotional swings, um, you understand that this time, this interruption, this disruption in our time has brought a lot of different emotions and, and feelings, and they swing uh, from, from one side of the pendulum all the way to the other. You see, this week is Holy Week, and, and I've been walking through uh, the gospel accounts of, of Jesus's final week here on earth, and what has, has really struck me about this final week has been the swing of emotions, right? From, from last Sunday being Palm Sunday, where Jesus rides into Jerusalem, and he is literally praying, weeping over Jerusalem, and the people they're rejoicing before him, chanting Hosanna, Hosanna, declaring him for rightly who he is. And then there's this moment of, of emotion, raw emotion with Jesus, where he flips over the tables in the temple. And it, it goes from that emotion to him stooping down and serving his, his disciples at the Passover table, washing their feet, breaking bread with them, having uh, the, the last supper with them, to, to the, all the emotion in the Garden of Gethsemane and, and obviously the crucifixion, the emotion that, that comes when, when, when Jesus breathes his last breath. It is finished and the veil in the temple is torn. Horn and what emotion that must have brought during Passover to all the people who see this curtain and this veil torn before them to now they're able to peer into the Holy of Holies, right? Or the, the, the Roman centurion soldier, this Gentile soldier, this irreligious guy who looks up at the cross and sees Jesus's death and he goes, that is the son of God. Or, or Joseph of Arimathea who, who, who asks for Jesus's body, this religious leader, Right, puts all his social status, all his, 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 his public notoriety on the line and says, I want the body of that man. And Joseph drapes his body with the dead body of Jesus and carries it to his tomb, not knowing that it would be borrowed, but he carries Jesus's body there. Or, or all of the people who witnessed Jesus's death, who were his disciples, right? The, the women at the foot of the cross, weeping and, and lamenting. You see, This Easter, I think if there's one thing we understand, is that this is an emotional time. This is a time where our feelings range. Maybe you just came out of singing that we just did in worship and and your heart is exploding with joy for the resurrected Christ. But maybe there's been a moment thinking about Easter where your heart is sad where you're sad and you're, you, you feel the weight that you're not able to gather with your friends and family, not just in a church setting, but maybe around a dinner table. 
Tessa and I, we were walking in our neighborhood and we ran into one of our covenant partners who, who lives close to us. And, and she's a, a lady who has, who has lost her husband recently and, and she can't be around her adult kids during this shelter in place. And she just honestly, in a moment of, of, of just, just beautiful honesty before us goes, this is the loneliest I have ever been in my life. And so listen, I, I want you to know that we get it that this Easter is full of joy, but also for many, full of pain and full of confusion. You see, the Gospels paint a deeply emotional picture of the resurrection. These powerful moments now as we fast forward to the end of the week, to Easter Sunday, the responses, the emotions of those people who first saw the resurrected Christ. You see, for Christianity, the resurrection is everything. This message is central and core to what we believe. It's what we put all of our stock in is that our savior didn't just die on Friday, but he rose victorious on Sunday. It's our message. N.T. Wright, I love what he says. He says this, he says, Easter has burst into our world, the world of space, time, and matter, the world of real history and real people and real life but our minds and imaginations are too small to contain it. But listen to this. So we do our best to put the sea into a bottle and fit the explosive fact of the resurrection into the possibilities we already know about. So here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do my best in the next 20 minutes or so to fit that sea of the resurrection into a bottle. And so this morning, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 28 and we'll be in verse verses one through 11, we're going to look at just one account of the resurrection. And particularly in this account, we're going to look at the emotions that were present. And so let's start in verse one. And so what we'll do is we'll read a little bit, talk, read a little bit and talk, and just let the resurrection wash over us in its power and life-giving beauty this morning. In verse one, Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. For he is not here, for he has risen. All right, so pause right there. Easter Sunday, Christ was in the tomb. Three days later, he is risen from the dead. And so let's get into this scene just a little bit with a couple of the characters. And it's these two women that this scene really focuses on. And these two women both carry the same name, Mary Magdalene, right? You can read her story in, in, in Luke 8 that tells that Jesus delivered her from seven demons and she became a Christ follower. She became a disciple. She was there witnessing his crucifixion, witnessing his, his burial. And now she's there witnessing firsthand his resurrection. And then it says also that there was another Mary there just called the other Mary. How would you like to be known as just the other Mary there? We know this Mary from earlier in Matthew is, is, is a Mary who, who had sons named Joseph and, and Joseph and, and James. And so these two women are key figures. And that's important because in this day and age, culturally speaking, uh, women were, were, were marginalized. Women, th- their testimony didn't, wouldn't even receive a, a welcome in court However, that's culturally speaking. What we see biblically speaking, even from this passage, is that's not the heart of our God. That Jesus first appears to these women. That these women are the ones who love Jesus to the point that they are still there with him at his tomb. Now, we don't get a a picture in this scene that the disciples are anywhere to be found. But Mary and the other Mary, they are there. And they witness this angel that shows up in power and makes the Easter announcement that Christ is risen. He's not here. But the angel also tells them to do two things. Look at at verse six. Let's, Let's finish it. After the angel has said, for he is not here, he is risen. He says this, come and see the place 
where he lay. So the first thing that the angel invites the Marys to do, these women to do, is to come and peer in to the empty tomb, to come lay eyes on, to have a firsthand experience that the tomb is empty, that Jesus is no longer there. They saw him be buried, and now they see that the tomb is empty. Now here, here's where the rubber meets the road. Here is the the beckoning of the Holy Spirit, right? Particularly every Easter, we are confronted with the same truth and the same reality we have to do something with. We are confronted with the reality of an empty tomb. And the Holy Spirit, just like this angel did to the Marys, beckons us, come and see. Come and see that the tomb that Jesus' body was laid in three days ago is empty. You see, we all have to do something with this empty tomb. We all have to do something with the reality that a body was there and it is no longer there. You see, for us as believers and as Christians, this is a beautiful reminder that the tomb of our Savior is empty and he is victorious. If you're watching in and you're not a believer, maybe you're a skeptic, maybe you're wondering, is the resurrection true or not true? There are all kinds of things that we could do to maybe form an apologetic or, or, or talk about reason and, and history and all those things. And even back to N.T. Wright, what he says is you offer a weak apologetic. The best thing we can do is hold up the word of God, hold up the evidence that that, that by name, Matthew calls out people who saw the resurrected Christ and say, listen, the tomb is empty. What does that mean for you? What does that mean for all of humanity? And he goes on. He doesn't just have them look at an empty tomb. He says, here, here's what I want you to do after you see the empty tomb. Verse seven, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead and behold, he is going before you to Galilee where you will see him. See, I have told you. And so now the first ask of the angel is come and see, come and see that it's empty. Firsthand experience here, you see where he laid. And now it's this, go and tell. This is the pattern of everyone who has put their faith and trust in the resurrected Messiah, Jesus Christ, is come and see, repent and believe, and now go and tell. That is the pattern for every disciple. And it starts here, that this meaningful work and mission that we've talked so much about as we've went through Acts is on display even immediately after the resurrection. So so get this, these ladies come to the tomb expecting to see a massive stone and a dead body. And instead they find an open tomb and no body with an angel sitting on top of it. Yeah, talk about a disruption or interference. And now verse eight tells us their emotion, their response. You see, not too long ago, the scene was this same Mary and the other Mary sitting at the tomb, lamenting, weeping, the gospel of Mark tells us. And take a look at their swing of emotions. Verse eight, so they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell the disciples. Right, and so this this idea of the emotion going from lamenting and weeping to now fear and joy, and this is a very unique combination of fear and great joy. It's 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 rare that we see them simultaneously. Right? I was trying to think of times in in our lives where we feel fear and, and joy simultaneously, and, and the best ones I could come up with are, are are some of you who have who have experienced having a child. Right, that moment where the child is born and like they hand him or her to you, and you realize with quaking fear that you are now responsible for this little life, but there is also this overwhelming joy, or, or maybe it's something a little bit more uh, simple than that. Maybe it's, 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 it's buying your own house or your first house. And you're like, whoa, what did we just do? How much money did we just spend? But yet there's this joy or, or, or or maybe for some of you who, who have went off to college and, and there's this, there's this fear, but there's also this, like this, this liberating joy that, that you're going on to the, to the next chapter. This fear and this joy is absolutely unique. This fear and this joy is something that only happens by the grace and mercy of God. And so the first emotion I do want to tackle is here. It's, it's fear. 
It says that they went on their way with fear. What kind of fear were they experiencing? Now, they were fearful early on and the angel said, do not be afraid. But the fear they left with, I think, was a different kind of fear. This is the same fear that Paul talks about in Philippians 2.12, where he says, listen, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So both of these women are followers of Jesus Christ. They have devoted their their lives to him. They love him with everything. And now they just were, were confronted with the greatest reality that he is still alive, that he is victorious, that everything he said, everything he did in his earthly ministry has been illuminated as true. He really is the son of God. So this fear that they are going with is a holy fear. This is an awe and a reverence. This is a God-given fear that, that, that the word of God speaks about in places like Jeremiah 32 that says God gives us his fear so that we would stand in awe, so that we would stand in worship of who he is. That this is, this is where the Bible would describe fear as being the beginning of wisdom. Like we don't have wisdom or right living before God without the proper fear of God. You see, the resurrection confronts us with the greatest reality on the planet that our sins have been forgiven. Or the most terrifying reality on the planet. That apart from faith and repentance in Christ, our sins haven't been forgiven. You see, Paul would go as far in 1 Corinthians to say, listen, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. But we as believers, like these these women saw the empty tomb, they, they, they realized that all that Jesus said was real and true and he was who he said he was. And so maybe this particular Easter season, um, you're well acquainted with the emotion of fear. And maybe not the, the holy kind, right? There is another aspect of fear, right? The, the unhealthy fear that's not from God, the ones that capture our hearts and our minds and our physical bodies sometimes. The fear that causes us to worry and fret and, and react out of our flesh. You see, what Easter preaches to us, what an empty tomb preaches to us is that there is only one place that ultimately answers our deepest fear and anxieties. And that is the empty tomb of Jesus Christ. That the cross confirms what is true about us. That the wages of our sin truly is death. But the resurrection is proof that our God has the authority. That Jesus has the authority to redeem us and save us from our sin. You see, I think during this quarantined Easter, we have a unique moment and opportunity to feel fear. Yeah, the unhealthy kind but see the empty tomb and sense the awesome fear of our God and who he truly is. And so I want us now just to take a moment and answer this question in our living rooms about how in this season, how has it uniquely allowed you to be more in awe of God? And also be honest. Conversely, how in this season have you been distracted from seeing the beauty and awe of God during this time? Talk about it for a little bit. Then we'll pick back up. Hey, welcome back. I hope the uh, discussions uh, went well. But fear isn't the only emotion uh, Matthew brings out from these two. Look back at verse eight. It says, they departed quickly from the tomb with fear, right? All reverence before God and great joy. 
Like there was something else happening in their hearts as well that, 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 that caused them to, to just leap out with excitement. And I think that the joy, the culmination of this joy is actually seen in verses nine through 11 as we finish this text. Look, and it says, and behold, Jesus met them and said greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. So the the culmination of the joy of the resurrection happens for these two as they are going to tell the disciples that Jesus is not dead, that he he has risen from the dead and that he's going to see them. Jesus actually intersects these two women on the way and he says, greetings. Like, what? Could there be a greater picture of love? Like Jesus didn't have to do this, but he does to show them, one, the truth of what they just witnessed, but also to show his love and his care and his concern for them. And this is exactly what Jesus said he was going to do. John chapter 16, if you have a Bible or your notes, just take it down. John chapter 16, it's this moment where Jesus is talking with his disciples. It's at the end of his life. And he's like, listen, I've told you this before, but in a few days, I'm going to die. And they all freak out and they're like, what are you talking about in a few days? Well, the time's not, it's, no, don't do that, Jesus. And he says something in, in, in John 16, verse 22, and I want you to hear this. He says, so also you have sorrow now, but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. Did you get that? You have sorrow now. These two women, they were lamenting, weeping at the grave. They were full of sorrow. But Jesus, before he dies, says, listen, you'll have that sorrow, but know this, you will see me again. And when you see me again, what is the emotion? What is the response from the life of a disciple, of a believer is this, joy, joy. We see that emotion coming out of these ladies. Listen, the resurrection is the greatest form and foundation for us to put our joy in. The resurrection is the power of God to save us from our sins. The joy in the resurrection is this, that we can stop our striving. We can stop all these these religious games, our failed pursuits to stack up to God and completely trust in the finished work of the cross that is punctuated by the empty tomb. That Jesus, on the day that he left his grave, rose victorious over death, sin, and hell. The resurrection puts everything in our lives into perspective. Everything in that moment where these ladies witnessed an empty tomb and were intersected with Christ came into clarity, right? The resurrection puts even these moments that we're in now into perspective. These moments where we we have no quick answers, where we can't flip to a chapter and a verse, where anxieties and emotions and fear can be on overdrive. We see that the resurrection is not just a vague hope for the future, but a sure faith that guides us even now. That the resurrection has to be more than just some vague theological point that we know is necessary, but really doesn't have any outworking in our lives. Paul puts it like this, that the same power that rose Christ from the dead is now alive in you. That changes things. You see, and if anything, this Easter has stripped from us even the ability for all the fluff and plastic shells, and to get to the substance, get to the straight heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This time has highlighted the greatest truth ever is that we're not in control. We're not in control of anything. I mean, think about the conversations you have been having with people, even casual people that you don't even know that you've casually met or neighbors you're talking to porch to porch. How quickly, think about how quickly you get to substance. Think about how quickly you get to the things that are really going on in people's life. I think about my two neighbors, particularly one who's who's walking through cancer during this time. Or or my neighbor across the street who's a 90-year-old widow walking through this time. Listen, we, we don't small talk. We talk about the things that matter. And this Easter, The one thing, the one thing, the only thing on this planet that matters is this, that Jesus came. He lived innocently and perfectly. He died for you and me to bear the weight and debt of our sins. And he rose victoriously. But hear this. 
And I'm going to read a quote to you here. It says that Easter doesn't suppress our pain. It doesn't minimize our loss. It doesn't minimize our loneliness. It doesn't minimize how we feel. It bids our burdens stand as they are in all their weight, with all their threats, and this risen Christ with the brilliance of indestructible life in his eyes says, these two I will claim in the victory. These two will serve your joy. These two, even these, I can make an occasion for rejoicing or joy. Listen, Easter has never been an occasion just to block out whatever troubles you to put on a happy face, right? To fake it till you make it, even though though I know that's what some churches have told you. That's what religion calls you to do. But the gospel calls you to something else. It calls you to bring with an honest heart, a life that is fully exposed and transparent before the one who created you and acknowledge that you can't save yourself, that you would put your faith and trust in the one who rose again from death. You see, the joy of Easter speaks tenderly to the pains that plague us. Whatever loss we lament, whatever burdens that weigh us down, Easter says it will not always be this way. You see, the message of Easter is the same thing that Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 16, that you will have sorrow, but what's coming when you see me again is a joy that no one can touch. Listen, church, Jesus has risen. The kingdom of God is here. He has conquered sin and death and the grave. He is alive and he is on his throne. That is the greatest news on earth. And that joy will culminate. Listen, not even when we get back together in this room, as much as we long to do that, that joy will culminate on the day when we see him again. And I hope what we get out of this quarantined Easter is that we would be excited and we would be full of the greatest joy and hope. And that is in the person of Jesus Christ and the hope that lies ahead, the joy that was purchased on the cross and secured in the resurrection, a joy no one can take, a joy that no virus can suspend or touch, a joy that Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, Where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Church, that is the hope of the resurrection, that Jesus on the cross took the sting of death and Jesus in the resurrection defeated death by death. That's our hope. That's our joy. Let's anchor in that. Happy Easter. Let's pray. Father, you alone are worthy of our whole lives. And God, I pray during this weird and strange season, you would do something miraculous in our hearts, our hearts and our lives and our emotions that are swinging from one end to the other, from one extreme to the other. God, we see that and I'm thankful for that picture in your word. God, of a hope that is secure because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So Lord, I pray for even those who who don't have that sure hope that this morning they would confess and put their trust in Jesus Christ, the resurrected Savior. For those of us who have followed him for years and years, we again would be stirred up with this hope that there is no other place where joy can be found. God, when circumstances are chaotic, the hope of Christ is secure. And so Lord, let us trust in that. God, I thank you for the Parks Church. I thank you for this faith family. Even as we're scattered, we can still feel like we are one family together under your son, Jesus. And God, I pray for this week upcoming that we would live in light of the resurrection more than we did last week. For your glory, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I love you all. Happy Easter again. And until we meet again, take care.